So today we're going to talk about bond enthalpy. Um, so first let's review what enthalpy actually is. Um, well, it's kind of hard to define what it is. We know that it's related to energy. Um, there isn't really a great definition for enthalpy. Uh, it is a calculation. Um, enthalpy is represented by the letter H and it is the sum of energy and the product of pressure and volume. Um, so remember a couple of things we've already gone over. Uh, internal energy is equal to the sum of heat and work. And work is equal to negative pressure times the change in volume. So basically if we, if we do a little math play, if we rearrange uh, the equation and we kind of substitute uh, things in for each other, we can actually end up with Q, which is heat, uh, equal to energy plus the sum of pressure times volume. Um, which is exactly the same equation for enthalpy. So the deal is, in any equation or any reaction um, in which the pressure remains constant, uh, the enthalpy change that's occurring during that chemical reaction is equal to the change in heat. So we can calculate the heat gained or lost uh, during a chemical reaction and call that enthalpy. So you'll notice that the terms uh, heat of reaction and change in enthalpy are used interchangeably. Uh, sometimes we ask for the heat of a reaction, sometimes we ask for the change in enthalpy. Either way, it would end up being the same thing as long as the pressure is constant. Now when we did calorimetry, um, we actually measured the change in temperature of a system. Um, we measured the mass of that system and multiplied all that times specific heat uh, to calculate heat. We were also calculating enthalpy at that point when we did that. So when we calculate Q, we are calculating enthalpy um, as well because they're equal to each other. Um, we can go a little bit further and actually calculate molar enthalpy by taking that value for Q, um, which is the same as your delta H, right? And dividing it by the moles of reactant that uh, reacted during the chemical change. Um, remember that we have to use the amount of limiting reactant, um, not, not any other amounts. And the most popular way to calculate enthalpy is to add up the sum of all of your enthalpies of your products and subtract the sum of all of your enthalpies of reactants. But there actually is a different way um, to calculate enthalpy. We can use bond energies to calculate enthalpy. So this looks a little complicated, but it's really not bad. Um, and actually, I think we've done this at a pre previous point in the year uh, when we discussed chemical bonds. So what happens is, Energy has to be absorbed in order to break bonds, right? Um, think about those reaction profiles we've studied where there's always that activation energy, right? It takes a certain amount of energy um, in order to break the existing bonds of a reactant. And then energy is always released whenever bonds form. And so they're using the letter D in this equation to represent bond energy. And we can calculate the enthalpy of a reaction by taking the sum of the bond energies of those bonds that are broken and subtracting the amount of energy released um, whenever new bonds form. Uh, now another way to think about that is, you know, your reactants are always those bonds that are breaking, right? Because we're breaking those apart and then we are forming new bonds to make products. So another way to think about it is that um, your enthalpy change is going to be equal to, and that should be an equal sign, not a minus there, uh, your enthalpy change right here should be equal to the sum of uh, the bond energies of your reactants minus the sum of the bond uh, energies of your products. So there is a data table on uh, in chapter 8 of your book and I will take a picture of that data table and I will post it um, to our general chat so that everybody has access to that information. But bond energies are just something that you can look up in a book. Um, remember that bond energy is related to bond length and also to multiple bonds. Um, if you have a bond in which those atoms are really close to each other, there's going to be a stronger force of attraction, so it's going to have a higher bond energy. Similarly, whenever you have bonds um, where there's multiple pairs of electrons being shared, like double or triple bonds, um, again, it's going to take more energy to break those bonds, so they have greater average bond energies. So the deal is we have to be able to calculate enthalpy change from bond energy, and I've put this kind of example up here. It's also in chapter eight um, of your book, I think. Um, 
first, we, you know, what we have to do is looking at the question, we need to figure out the change in enthalpy that occurs when methane burns in oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Um, since we're talking about a chemical change, we got to write an equation and we got to balance it. So if I've got methane burning in oxygen, uh, producing carbon dioxide and water, then I write the formulas for each of those reactants and products, and then I put those coefficients to balance the equation. So there we have it, equation balance. So the next step is we actually have to go back and draw those Lewis dot structures for each of our reactants and products. Um, that's why we did this whenever we did uh, chemical bonds, whenever we studied chemical bonds. So I actually uh, have pictures of each of the Lewis dot structures. We have methane here. We have oxygen here. It's a double bond. We have double bonds of oxygen to carbon for carbon dioxide. And then we have water right here. It's really important to draw those Lewis dot structures so we know what bonds are present. I know in methane, I have four hydrogen to carbon bonds. So there's a hydrogen to carbon, there's a hydrogen to carbon, here's one, here's one. Uh, I know that in each O2 molecule, um, there is a double bond between two oxygens. Now remember the coefficient in that chemical equation, we had a two in front of this substance. So really we would have two total oxygen to oxygen double bonds. There's an oxygen to carbon double bond here and another one here, so I have two of those. And then for each water molecule, I have two oxygen to hydrogen uh, single bonds. Uh, remember again, there was a coefficient of two uh, in front of water as well. So we would double that and that would be four total um, oxygen to hydrogen bonds. And so again, I just looked at those Lewis dot structures and looked at my coefficients and figured out how many of each type of bond um, I had. And this should be oxygen to oxygen double bond. We said that there were gonna be two of those um, because we had to put a coefficient of two in front of O2. So I have four carbon to hydrogen bonds because of that methane molecule. Um, again, I'm gonna have two oxygen to oxygen double bonds. Uh, I have two oxygen to carbon double bonds and then four total oxygen to hydrogen single bonds um, because each water has two of those and there are two waters. So then we just look up the value for each of those types of bonds. And again, I'm gonna send out that data table so that you guys can look that stuff up pretty easily. What we need to do then is, since those uh, bond energies are given in kilojoules per mole, I have to multiply that by the number of moles of each bond that are present. So we said we had four carbon to hydrogen bonds. So if I've got four of those in my um, reactants, then I need to multiply that bond uh, energy times four. And so that would be the total uh, amount of energy uh, that's going to be absorbed to break those four moles of carbon to hydrogen uh, single bonds. And so I just repeat that process for each of those types of bonds. But we had two moles of the oxygen to oxygen double bond multiplied by its bond energy gives me that total there. And then the last step is we actually have to find the sum of our reactants and the sum of our products and then subtract them. So my reactants were methane and O2. And so if I take those uh, amounts of energy for the reactants and add them together and then subtract the sum of the energies of the products, I end up with an overall change in enthalpy for this reaction being a negative 824 kilojoules. So what does that mean? We need to remember that the sign on that enthalpy value uh, is significant, it matters. Um, if a reaction absorbs energy, it's endothermic. If it releases energy, then it's exothermic. And so anytime you have a negative uh, change in enthalpy, that's gonna be an exothermic reaction because energy is being released, energy is leaving the system. Um, we have less energy present now than we did before. Overall, there was a loss of energy from reactant to product. So that gives us a negative value. Um, if we change the sign to a positive, then, we, then energy is being gained by the system. So energy is being absorbed and we are gaining energy overall. My products have more energy than my reactants. So uh, that would be a positive uh, change in enthalpy, meaning it's endothermic. Okay, so I hope that this was helpful for you guys. Um, feel free to put any comments that you need to uh, in our post. Um, feel free to ask questions. And uh, when we meet face-to-face, -face, make sure you guys have your questions ready.